Shane Claiborne is a new kind of Christian. He lives among the poorest of the poor in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in a community called The Simple Way. His cohabitors share money and possessions and try to make a positive impact on their neighborhood by giving away food and helping kids with homework. His book, The Irresistible Revolution, challenges Christians to take a second look at their Bible and the life of Jesus. I, know, I've been I had the chance to sit down with him recently in Toronto and ask him about his views on poverty, wealth, community, and how his three months working with Mother Teresa impacted his somewhat so, radical uh, ideology. But, you know, when I got to India, that's really what uh, I experienced was this, this innocent, uh, uh, just childlike faith of we're gonna we're gonna take Jesus seriously and um, and and Mother Teresa she was out on the streets you know she was hanging out with kids and uh, I worked in the the first home that she started which was Kaligat the home for the destitute and dying and we would go out in the streets every day and uh, bring people in who were dying and completely alone and. Uh, and we would hold them and laugh with them and pray with them and feed them and sing songs and then every day they would people would die and we would go out in the streets and bring in more people you know and uh for for a lot of people that sounds really uh morbid you know <laughs> but but it was a place where you really could feel uh the, the promise of resurrection and the the power that life is more powerful than death and when, when you go into the morgue in the home for the dying it says on the wall I'm on my way to heaven and when you walk out above the door it says thanks for helping me get here mm. so it was just a, a place where you, you really uh, uh, felt the, the smallness of every act that you do having significance to someone and, and Mother Teresa that's what she really believed in was we can do no great things but only small things with great love it's not how much you do but how much love you put into every act and I, I think that's what I really learned in Calcutta because I um, I had caught this vision for revolution you know for changing the world and, and, and Mother Teresa like well yeah start with one person <laughs> You know, and they, and someone asked her, they said, how have you managed to lift 50,000 people off the streets of Calcutta? And she said, I started with one, and that worked pretty well. You know, so you, that, and I think that's what a lot of us need permission to do, is, is not just to, 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 to do all the huge stuff, but to, to love one person well. And so above our door in Philadelphia today, uh, uh, it says, today, small things with great love or don't answer the door. You know, so th th that's really what we, we try to stay true to. And you advocate this whole idea of uh, when you live in community and you, you pool your money together, you advocate the redistribution of wealth. What does that mean? Well, I, in the early church, when it says the offerings were put at the apostles' feet and they were redistributed to people as they had needs, that there was this radical economy uh, of, of, of sharing where people were committed to bearing each other's burdens and, and sharing the needs of, of the community together and the resources of the community together. Um, I, now, a lot of times people say, oh, it sounds like socialism or communism or something, you know, and, and I, I like to say uh, once we've really discovered how to love our neighbor as ourself, capitalism as we know it won't be possible and Marxism won't be necessary. That, you know, that this isn't about a new system or an ism, but it's about neighborly love that, that means that we radically redefine our possessions. And redistribution is only meaningful in as much as it's rooted in love. The scripture says we can sell everything we have and give it to the poor, but if we don't have love, then it's, it's nothing, you know. Uh, so the, the early church wasn't a community because they redistributed stuff. They redistributed stuff because they were a community. They had figured out, like, uh, I am born again. Like, and that means if I have two coats, I've stolen one because there's someone else that's still freezing, you know? Like, I, I can't have more food than I need while someone else is hungry, like, uh, like because this is my family. This is my sister or brother. And, and that, that, I think, what, is, is what was so radical about the ethic of the early church was that that, that meant the, a redistribution. And you see it all the way. I mean, it's all through Scripture. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But then he also said, and if you've got two tunics, give one away. You know, And, and you see that all the way through, I, I think, the, the economy of the early church. 
All right, so when you talk about the redistribution of wealth or sharing with others, you're not just talking about writing a check to the United Way, right? Like, what, yeah. what, are, you, what are you talking about? Yeah, it, it's very interesting in the 25th chapter of Matthew when Jesus talks about when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. Um, it, it, they aren't distant acts of charity. You know, it's not when I was hungry, you wrote a check to the United Way and they fed me. You know, when, when I was naked, you uh, uh, gave money to the Salvation Army and they clothed me. But they're all very personal acts. You know, it, it, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was homeless, you welcomed me into your home. Uh, and when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto Christ. And what I, what I see in that is, uh, is this call to relationship. Uh, and and the, 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 the acts of charity and the redistribution, that, that, that's really, really important. Uh, it's a part of, I think, what it means to be a Christian and to follow Christ. But uh, just as important uh, as that uh, is that we be in relationship to the poor. And Mother Teresa said, it's very fashionable to talk about the poor but it's not as fashionable to talk to the poor. And I think that we can do all sorts of checks. We can eat all fair trade and, you know, drive a, a hybrid car or whatever, you know, whatever it is and still not be in relationship with uh, uh, people who are hurting and in poverty. And, and that, that's, that's uh, really one of the central calls uh, of Christ. And, and I'm convinced that the great tragedy in the church is not just that rich folks don't care about poor folks, but that rich folks don't know poor folks. Because when we really have an encounter across class, it, the discomfort of the poor becomes our discomfort, you know, and, and it, it begins to challenge the things uh, that we hold true. It changes conversations in church board meetings where you're arguing about whether or not you're going to buy a heater for the baptismal <laughs> when, you, when you realize that we've got sisters and brothers in El Salvador that are dying because they don't even have water. Uh, so I, I think that's um, just as important as the campaigns like Make Poverty History are, it's just Im as important to make poverty personal. So is it a sin to be rich? Uh, you, it's funny, I've gotten to know Rick Warren. Uh, out, uh, he, he wrote The Purpose Driven Life and he was asked that question. He had a great answer. He said, uh, it's not always a sin to get rich. Uh, I mean, sometimes you write a book and it sells a million copies. But Rick said, it's a sin to die rich. And that's, that's a really interesting answer. You know, I, I think that sometimes we, we, we don't know what all comes at us, but we need to get rid of it as, as quick as we can. And John Wesley, uh, who is a hero of mine, he, he said, if I should die with more than 10 pounds, may every person call me a liar and a thief because I betrayed the gospel and the poor. And what he, um, what he did was he capped his income off every year and he, he would only live off of a certain amount and he would give the rest of the way away, which in the beginning was pretty easy because he didn't have much money. But then he started generating large amounts of money and he still lived at the poverty level and then he gave the rest away. So I, I think that's where it, it almost doesn't matter how much we give, but how much we have left. You know, when, when at the end of the day, someone that we meet or that we know uh, doesn't uh, have the things that they need. You talk a lot about working with the poor and some of the criticism that maybe the evangelical church has um, said towards you is that what about evangelism? What about people's eternal souls? You're focusing so much on their physical needs. What about caring for where they're going to spend eternity? What do you, how do you respond to those kinds of comments? Ah, oh, you know, I think that it's such an age-old division of, you know, oh, is this about winning souls or is it about caring for bodies? And it, it's, 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 it's something that... Um, to me, these are, are two sides of the same coin, you know, uh, and uh, evangelism and caring for and compassion, they have to go together. Uh, uh, otherwise, you, you can't have a heads and tails. You just don't have a coin anymore. And, and, and like, or, or like sides of a scissors, they, they just have to work together. So I am so excited about people falling in love with Jesus. I love to share Jesus. But I also know that one of the largest causes of atheism in the world has been Christians, <laughs> who we have so much to shout and proclaim with our mouths and very little to show with our lives and with our hands and with our feet. And so I want a Christianity that, that offers people uh, something worth believing in. You know, I, I want a Christianity that, that offers people um, a Jesus that they can see and touch and feel. And I think as Christians, as we talk about being the body of Christ, that, that it's very literal. Like we, we are to uh, be the fragrance of Jesus in the world. We're to be uh, the, the things that Jesus was. And that's the, the best way to uh, 
lead people towards Jesus, I think, is when they can feel the Spirit of God, and they can feel love, and they can feel hope. Uh, so, the, the St. Francis, you know, he said, preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words. Uh, I think it's necessary to use words, but I also think that the world's had a lot of words. And what, what they, uh, at the end of the day, they're not going to know that we're Christians by our t-shirts and bumper stickers, but by our love.